Chris Lado. Welcome to Lado Files. What's up, guys? Welcome to the channel. Got an exciting show today from the microscopic to the macroscopic. There's been some amazing breakthroughs in both microscopic understanding of cellular life by Michael Levin. And there's also been exciting discoveries from Hubble Space Telescope at the microscopic levels. Could these be related? I get a lot of comments as above, so below. Is it true? Show you how that might be possible in this video. Thanks for being here. I just saw Dr. Michael Levin's work. It is quite astounding and I believe breakthrough. What I've been looking for in my theory. Michael Levin is an American developmental and synthetic biologist at Tufts University, where he is the Benever Bush Distinguished Professor. Levin is a director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts University and Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. He's also co-director of the Institute of Computationally Designed Organisms with Joshua Bongard. He was born in Moscow in 1969, emigrated to the U.S. in 1978 from a anti-Semitism law. He has a PhD from Harvard University, so this guy is no slouch. He's known for left-right asymmetry, bioelectricity we'll talk to in this, and xenobots. Super exciting stuff. Thanks for being here, everybody. Please smash that like button, subscribe to get notifications of when I release future videos at least once a week every Friday. And then if you want to support the channel further, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lado. You won't see any advertisements for other stuff on this channel, only UAP Society. Let's get to the video. If you watched any of my previous videos on the macroscopic and microscopic forms of life, I argue that we're actually part of a continuing system of life that goes up to many levels, possibly all the way up to the galaxy, even the universe. One key sticking point I couldn't figure out, didn't click in my brain until I saw Michael Levin's work, was how do nations, for instance, how do they organize collectively? Because if you look at the actual DNA of the people involved in nations, it doesn't code specifically to form a nation, right? We can't find that in the genome. So where is this data coming from? Was it coming from human DNA? Is it coming from somewhere else? Michael Levin here shows us where does that anatomical pattern come from? How do things regenerate? How will an arm of a salamander regenerate to the exact right proportions and stop growing? You know, if we break through on this medical breakthrough, imagine the possibility. Uh, over some amount of time, they, uh, without any instructions from, from outside, they spontaneously self-assemble the creature that uh, has uh, sophisticated cognition and first-person perspective and all these things. And this is a cross-section through a, a human torso. Look at the remarkable order here, right? The, um, the just, just, just amazing uh, invariant structure where all the tissues, organs, everything is in the right place next to the right thing. Where does that anatomical pattern come from? I mean, we can read genomes now, and we know it's not in the DNA. DNA specifies proteins. It does not directly specify anatomy. So we have these difficult questions of how do these collections of cells know what to make, when to stop? How do we re uh, convince them to rebuild after, um, after damage? And as engineers, and this is going to lead into um, Josh's talk next, um, we'd like to know how far can we push this actually? Could we get these same cells to build something completely different? Amazing breakthroughs here. I mean, just think about how complicated the human body is. The last account I saw was 37 trillion cells. How does each little tiny cell actually know what to do? How does it form and create actual biological living tissue of billions of cells, hundreds of billions of cells, just mind boggling. It's not in the DNA, right? DNA has just your four base pairs. How could that possibly code for all of this? And what we're finding, which I've always suspected, and I'm sure other people have as well, there must be a secondary layer, like a secondary coding pattern on top of DNA. So how could it actually code? Michael Levin here appears to have found how that process works. And he calls that process intelligence. Watch how he defines intelligence here and how it relates to the collective organization of an organism. And so now this emergent feed forward patterning process, which people lot often think about with, in, with complexity theory and emergence, you know, lots of local rules and then out comes something, something amazing. There's actually even much more. I mean, that's amazing enough, but it's actually much more interesting than that. So, so the first thing we got to remember is that cells are extremely competent. This is a single cell creature. This is a lacrimarium. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. Um, there, uh, th this, this, uh, this, this uh, creature handles all of its 
physiological, metabolic, and morphological goals at the single cell scale. If you're into soft robotics, uh, you're probably really jealous of this. We don't have anything that um, begins to uh, compare with this, with this degree of control. Again, one single cell. So think about what Michael just said there, or Dr. Levin. He just said that this thing has no brain. There's no brain in this single cell organism, right? I mean, think of jellyfish. They don't have a brain. How does that work? How can that possibly work? Our current understanding of biology is that shouldn't work necessarily, right? The brain should be controlling all the disease. The brain creates the intelligence. But if you look here now, this single cell organism has no brain and it's running around interacting with the environment, right? It's using intelligence. I would consider it some sort of intelligence there. But this is at the single cellular level with no brain. If you're into soft robotics, uh, you're probably really jealous of this. We don't have anything that um, begins to uh, compare with this, with this degree of control. Again, one single cell. And so uh, we can start by, um, by thinking about uh, this. And, and so we start with this definition of intelligence that I quite like from William James, which is the ability to reach the same ends by different means. So he defines intelligence as same ends by different means. I mean, if you think about that, it means that whatever is in the environment, whatever is operating in the environment has to respond to changes. So different means, you'll see where he goes with this with intelligence, but getting to the same ends by different means. Let's see his, let's see, he goes through a couple examples here that really define it. Thinking about uh, this, and, and so we start with this definition of intelligence that I quite like from William James, which is the ability to reach the same ends by different means. Let's look at a few examples. Uh, kidney tubule, and it looks like this, and there's eight to 10 cells that work together to build this thing. If you modify the initial egg in a way that uh, produces very uh, gigantic cells, fewer and fewer cells will work together to make exactly the same diameter lumens until the cells get so big that just one cell will wrap around itself to produce exactly the same anatomical outcome. So this is his first example. And basically they take newt cells. So newt cells that split. And first off, he describes that we can't actually split anything perfectly in the real world, okay? We, we haven't been able to actually mimic this behavior of perfect identical splits. The new kidney says they split, okay? But what they find is it will change. The morphology of it will, will physically change. It will use less, less cells if those cells are not provided, right? Even with less cells, it will still end up forming the same final shape from different beginnings, different beginning starting points it ends up at the same complex pattern in function. The leg will begin to grow. It will grow exactly as much as needed from wherever it is that you cut it. And it will stop when a correct salamander leg has been produced, right? So we need to understand this process of anatomical homeostasis. You keep, um, keep growing and keep remodeling until you get to the correct shape. And then you can stop some sort of means ends analysis, something like that. Here's a second example. So how does a salamander grow its arm back exactly to the original specifications, right? It doesn't matter where you chop the arm of a salamander, it will still grow back to look roughly like the original arm, right? Imagine what we could do with this sort of medical technology in humans. And secondly, how does this work? Again, the code for that is not in the DNA as far as he says. So here we have the ability in, in these examples that I'm showing you to get to the same outcome despite perturbations, despite uh, diverse starting positions. Here's a radical example of that. A few years ago, we discovered that, well, in, in the normal journey from tadpole to frog, of course, the faces are different. They have to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move forward. The jaws have to come out. And it was thought that because all tadpoles look the same and all frogs look the same, all you have to do is, is somehow code in what direction and how far they move. So we made these so-called Picasso tadpoles. Everything is in the wrong place. The eyes are on the side of the head. The jaws are off kilter. Everything is wrong. These animals make largely perfectly good frogs because all of this stuff will continue to move in novel uh, uh, paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and have to double back until a correct frog face is produced and then they stop. So what the genetics actually gives us is a system that can make up for all kinds of um, errors and deviations and uh, in, in its, in its, uh, in its um, uh, uh, attempts to get to uh, the correct uh, set point, the correct target morphology. So that's his third example is intelligence in biological systems, right? So they started with the frogs, the tadpoles, they messed up the tadpoles. Okay, it's, so they messed up the original tadpole design, right? Genetically or physically. And what they found was actually at the end, it ended up fixing itself, getting back to a basic frog shape. So Dr. Levin has more experiments that he goes through with flatworms, planarians, very exciting stuff. 
What he proposes here, and they have valid data, is that there's bioelectricity going on. There's basically communication between all of these cells at a much, much lower level than we're expecting. There's a basic intelligence almost built into the cells. And what it is, is bioelectricity running on top of the actual DNA. It looks like a secondary layer. And they can code for this. They can actually change coding of these animals. So this is bioelectricity, how they pattern memory, how you can encode memory. Watch this. We altered the bioelectric pattern that is stably stored by, the, by this tissue to remember how many heads a planarian is supposed to have. So this is the normal wild type pattern. This, and it's, of course, it's, it's pretty messy still. We're still working out the technology. But you can see here that what we've done is we've actually um, uh, basically incepted a pattern here that says, no, a normal planarian has two heads. Now, this is a really critical part. This map, this voltage map, is not a map of this two-headed creature. This voltage map is a map of this guy, meaning that the, the bioelectrics doesn't reflect what the anatomy is doing. The bioelectrics is a completely separate layer, and a single-headed, normal, anatomically normal worm can have one of two possible uh, representations internally stored in this electrical circuit of what a correct planarian looks like in case it gets injured, what is it going to do? Okay, So this is, um, this is basically a, a primitive evolutionary version of a counterfactual memory. This animal uh, stores information for what it's going to do if a particular uh, scenario comes up. And we can rewrite that. So this is a neuroscience. This would be equivalent to um, incepting false memories into mouse brains with optogenetics and so on. So, the, so, so no, doubt we, no doubt there are more than two states that can be put in. This is just two that we've, we've nailed down so far. So using special dyes, they're able to see the actual interactions of these cells So when they're communicating. So this is what you see here. This is like the cells communicating, okay? Bioelectric pattern. And what they did was they were able to activate somehow the whole organism bioelectrically, right? And now it basically says, put a head here and put a head here. So they created double headed organisms. They seem relatively happy. You can cut these things and they will just regrow back to their original shape. But now that they've been bioelectrically changed, they can actually grow back to different organisms. So Dr. Levin's found a way to actually hack bioelectrically these organisms, planarians, to create even older organisms, to bring out different organisms from the cut pieces. They can do two-headed, they can do single-head, they can do all of these things. So amazing stuff here. Please check out the full video in the description. Now, how does it relate to as above? Okay, so this is as below, okay? Could it be as above? So here we'll check out one of my favorite YouTubers, Anton Petrov, about space, cool stuff. He reported on a very, very interesting case that the Hubble found. The Hubble has found that actually galaxies, in particular, the Milky Way galaxy, has a galactic shield around it. And furthermore, the Milky Way galaxy is stealing, if you will, eating, taking gas and dust from other galaxies, okay? From other galaxies that are around. Almost like it's acting like a cell. Some of the new discoveries, in regards to what the scientists refer to as a kind of a protective shield that seems to surround the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, preventing the Milky Way galaxy from stealing some of their gas, and preventing them from falling apart completely as they interact with the Milky Way galaxy. Something that the scientists refer to as a Magellanic Corona because it surrounds two of the galaxies, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud that you can sort of see right there in the top left corner orbiting around the Milky Way. And so in this case, the scientists are actually solving one of the older mysteries that help the scientists understand how certain galaxies evolve and more importantly, discovering and confirming a very important feature of various galaxies that allows them to maintain their shape and allows them to continuously create new stars. So listen to that. Galaxies are allowed to keep their same shape and to continuously create new stars. I mean, it sounds kind of familiar, right? It's like a membrane. And then what is it creating? It's almost like a mitochondria or something in there, right? Some sort of structure. So they, what they found is there's streams. There's actually large streams of galactic material, gas and dust flowing into and out of separate galaxies. And in this area of the Milky Way, particularly the Tarantula Nebula, is huge, huge star formation. Basically not seen anywhere else except when we look back into the early, early universe. So the formation of the early universe, almost like mitochondria, if you know that, that analogy. But interestingly enough, the similar streams do exist around the Magellanic Cloud galaxies as well. As a matter of fact, they're actually pretty clearly visible in this image right here. 
This is a collection of various stars and various gas. And so clearly these galaxies are also losing a lot of their mass and are slowly being stripped apart by the Milky Way. We've discussed this in one of the older videos you can also find in the description. But this is I guess where the mystery kind of starts. We see the streams, we see the interaction, but we also see ridiculously powerful regions such as the Tarantula Nebula that produce huge amounts of stars. As a matter of fact, this is the most active star-forming region in the nearby galactic space. And that implies that there is quite a lot of molecular gas here, and quite a lot of it is still being delivered to the galaxy to produce even more very powerful, very massive stars. This particular region has even been compared to some of the earliest regions in the existence of the early universe that doesn't actually exist anywhere else in the nearby galactic space. So think of that. You have galaxies who, for some reason, are maintaining their shape. We have flows of material, gas and dust, and stars flowing in between galaxies into certain particular areas of galaxies, such as the Tarantula Nebula, where you have massive, massive star formation, massive star creation. So the idea is this could be filling the same function as a cell, that single cell organism we saw at the beginning of the video. Through some sort of intelligence, it's a collective intelligence, the galaxy could form into the same function. So you're looking at through decidedly different means, we get to the same ends. As above, so below, and our level. Check out my previous videos on this topic, on this theory of microscopic form of life. Okay, could there be macroscopic life? We were pretty surprised when there was microscopic life, weren't we? People still don't want to believe it, right? You still get sick because it's raining, because you get cold. Maybe that happens, but it's also due to the viruses that infect you. Could there also be the same thing above? I argue this is what we're finding right now. We are finding macroscopic life and we're gonna have huge, huge breakthroughs. Thanks for being everybody. Smash that like button, subscribe for future content and notifications. Always you can support the channel on patreon.com. Get your name in the credits like these guys. Thank you so much for all your support patrons and for exclusive videos on there. I've been putting out exclusive videos. And as always, you won't see any advertisements for other companies on here. We only advertise our company. We're only gonna swag our stuff, which is UAP Society. That's the company we started. Come to our Discord. Join our decentralized organization to try and find the truth of UAPs. And I think it does have something to do with learning more about our universe. Imagine that. Then we can get fast breakthroughs. I know you want me to do what everyone has been doing for the last 80 years, but I physically can't do what anyone else is doing. It's built into my DNA. So we're going to do something different. It's going to be out of the box. It's going to be using new technology. And we're going to break the chains of our old legacy paradigms. Welcome aboard. Have a great day. Peace.